Uh, what do you notice most about this panel of ministers? Uh, we've almost got the gender balance right, so I think this is a, a good start to the occasion. We also have the balance right between uh, ministers of education and ministers of ICT. Uh, my name is Tim Unwin. I, I have the privilege to be uh, both a UNESCO chair, so my UNESCO credentials, uh, but also a member of the advisory board of the ITU's Empowering Development Initiative. And to set the scene, uh, under the, the leadership of Brahim Asanu, MPD, as we like to call it, Empowering Development, uh, was about how we can find ways through which mobile devices in, in their huge diversity can actually contribute to moving uh, development forward. And I define development not about economic growth, but about inequality. How can we use digital devices to enable the poorest and the most marginalized within our societies to have a better life? And, and as Indrajit said just earlier, the poorest and the most marginalized for me are not actually women, but people with disabilities. Uh, yes, we have to do more on gender, but people with disabilities uh, have perhaps the most to gain from our, our use of technologies. But one of the key findings of the Empowering Development Initiative has been, and I think we all know it, but rarely speak it, that there is never enough integration in government. Very rarely do ministers of technology, ministers of education, finance ministers, ministers of infrastructure, actually have those discussions that are so essential to make things happen. We have to have integrated, joined up approaches. And that is why the collaboration at the highest level between UN bodies such as the ITU and UNESCO matters. The ITU and UNESCO have long collaborated in the Broadband Commission uh, through uh, Brahima and, and the colleagues in, in UNESCO. Uh, we're now trying to make this more joined up uh, at, at the ministerial level across the board. So that is the purpose of today's session. Um, I'm asking the ministers each to contribute for only five minutes, and here I need your help, because they will be looking at you, not me. Now, some of you know uh, about sports, so I have a yellow card, ministers, which means you have one minute to go, and a red card, which means, and I have been told that there are secret devices under this table that, that, that actually can do things to people if they don't keep quiet. But uh, in, in reality, you know, if I show the red card and they don't notice it, you know, can you wave? You know, we, we need participant interaction. I know they're important. I know they're ministers, um, but, but uh, you know, we have to be equal and treat them that way. So I will have a pinger. The, these, these aren't anything about communication other than it, it's an alarm clock, and I'll put it there as well when the time is really up. Okay, uh, I want this to be interactive. They're going to keep for speaking for a relatively short time so we can then get audience participation in this. Uh, the ITU have given me a script to read, so I must now behave. Um, some of you who know me know I'm not used to behaving, uh, but I will do my best to be civil, polite, uh, and encourage debate. So you get the idea, honorable ministers. We're going to have fun today, but actually do good business. So formally, uh, the new sustainable development goals, uh, if, can anybody remember any of them? Shh, I said I wasn't going to be naughty, so I mustn't say things like that. Uh, but, but they're meant to, no, sorry, they are providing a broad common framework and vision for development in the future. And we all know that mobile learning has enormous potential to support the attainment of a range of goals, indeed all of the goals, um, but particularly SDG 4. And you know, we, we, we can see how it has the potential to address inequalities of learning opportunities between rural and urban children and young people. Or introducing pedagogical opportunities within the education system, improving school administration, extending the reach of education beyond the classroom into areas such as vocational and technical education, which is so important. Allowing students to take a more active role in their own learning, as we've heard about earlier this week. Mobile learning has a key role to enable girls to have access to education where there are few formal opportunities. And it has, as I've said, a key role to play in supporting people with disabilities. So, Honorable George Kronisanyan Werner, Minister of Education in Liberia, let me begin with you. You have the, drawn the short straw, the five-minute test. Uh, and so in, in five minutes, how do you see the potential and opportunities of mobile learning in the context of your country? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, within the time available to us, let me speak succinctly uh, 
as I possibly can about five things in five minutes. And the first is uh, what the Sustainable Development Goals call for, lifelong learning, peace, and stability. If we are going to have peace and stability, we must invest in jobs. There is a connection between technology and job creation. That's the first thing. The second thing is STEM education to increase economic development. The third thing is research collaboration for universities to increase the level of studies, integrate them, and create a global workforce. The fourth is an idea that we in Liberia have been in a way playing with and sharing with others. For many of us in that part of the world, we know that an unplanned pregnancy is the reason why a girl will not go to school. So technology has a role to play in terms of allowing girls, when they get pregnant, to continue their education through graduation, but also helping them through technology to stay in touch with their doctors and keep the appointments. So health and education collaborating to keep girls in school using technology. The fifth thing that we want to stress is the policy outline, which is where this should begin, must integrate partnerships, public-private partnerships, that why a private provider can make a small profit, we aim at, as many have said, not leaving any child behind because of geography where they live, because of income, or because they are not connected to the right family. We in Liberia, our doors are open. We've had several tragedies in our lives that set us back. But in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, we want to be radical. We don't want to rebuild what was or restore what was. We want something new. This forum provides us with that opportunity to create such partnerships. Thank you. An important question is therefore how to build the school infrastructure that is needed to support mobile learning, including the upgrade, full deployment of broadband, Wi-Fi network connectivity, as well as, of course, and we often forget it, uh, the provision of reliable electricity in schools and particularly in rural mountainous areas. This is really important if we are to achieve the need for universal coverage of the education system. So I now turn to you, uh, Your Excellency Aminata Sana Congo, uh, Minister of Development of the Digital Economy and Posts in Burkina Faso. Comment d'offrir une connectivité à large bande pour les écoles, les autres établissements d'enseignement seront abordés dans les politiques nationales et les plans d'étiquette à large bande. Que doit supporter le coût en particulier pour les zones mal desservies Y a-t-il un rôle possible pour les fonds de services universels dans tout cela Madame Ministre. Le Burkina Faso a réalisé la réforme du secteur des télécommunications en 1998, ce qui a permis de booster le secteur en entraînant le développement des réseaux de, et services. Trois opérateurs téléphoniques assurent une couverture du territoire à 92% avec plus de 12 millions d'abonnés sur une population de 17 millions. Et deux opérateurs sur les trois offrent les services de 3G et ce qui a entraîné une explosion de l'utilisation de l'Internet avec environ 2 millions d'abonnés. Le mobile est un puissant vecteur du développement pour mon pays. Grâce à sa grande capacité de diffusion, le mobile pourra contribuer à augmenter le taux de scolarisation parce qu'il facilite l'accès à l'information et au savoir permettant aux, aux populations les plus eh, enclavées d'accéder à la connaissance. Et la connectivité large bande des écoles et autres centres de formation est une composante majeure des politiques et plans nationaux de développement des TIC et de la large bande. Cette problématique est prise en charge par le service universel. Il faut noter que le développement de la large bande est un défi pour le Burkina Faso à l'instar des autres pays en développement. C'est pourquoi beaucoup d'initiatives sont en cours en vue de l'accès 
et du plus grand nombre, notamment de la population vulnérable, et les femmes et les jeunes au service de la large bande. Et on peut noter le projet Backbone, et où il y aura un maillage de tout le pays jusqu'aux communes en fibre optique. Il y a aussi le projet de mise en place d'un point d'échange Internet pour optimiser l'utilisation de la large passante à l'international. Il y a la mise en place d'un point d'atterrissement virtuel et par la mise à disposition des opérateurs d'une plus grande capacité de bande passante à Ouagadougou. Mon département, en, en collaboration est très étroite avec celui de l'éducation pour une meilleure cyberstratégie sectorielle de, de l'éducation en vue d'une intégration réussie des TIC dans l'éducation est, est en œuvre. Mon pays va s'approprier des conclusions issues de ses travaux de Paris qu'il partagera avec le département en charge de l'éducation et avec toutes les structures d'enseignement et de centres de formation. Nous poursuivons les grands projets de développement de large bande qui demeurent la base de mobilisation du potentiel des TIC en général et l'intégration des TIC dans l'éducation en particulier. Je vous remercie. It can support education in a range of different ways and can empower teachers, students and indeed parents in the learning process. It includes a range of policies fundamentally to improve the learning experience through greater personalization and learner autonomy, introducing collaborative learning and improving a range of pedagogical approaches theoretically for maximum beneficial impact. And, and hopefully they can be used to meet or exceed educational goals. A Senora Kitaria Hamengilda Maboti, Inspector General for the Ministry of Education in Mozambique. Que sont les principaux bénéfices que peut donner cette étrange à travers l'apprentissage en Movelle et Mozambique? Only in general education, we have about 7 million students. In primary schools, 6 million students. So, the need of M learning is very, very big. And we think that with M learning, we can increase the population and school attendance and reduce dropout rates that is very high in our countries, especially among girls. We can also democratize and spread access to knowledge, increase teachers' access to IT, creating for this purpose initiatives that involve a set of stakeholders from the private sector as banks telephone companies, operators, and equipment and content suppliers. We can also boost the consumption of digital contents by teachers and gradually their production and sharing. Uh, contribute for the introduction of ITs in the classrooms as a learning and management tool has to positively change the teacher's role increase access to information and knowledge to girls and women, particularly in isolated areas. We can also provide learning and life skills that suits individual needs. Another thing that mobile learning can do in our country is to ensure a more inclusive and relevant education for all. That is a major constraint the development of electronic contents and applications allows the growth of knowledge base in the country. Can also empower citizens with the critical skills for the country's economy. Through mobile learning, we can transmit useful information to the families, streamline local business community, and promote entrepreneurship. Lastly, I would like to say that because M-Learning allows an open network, I think that one of the major benefits for the education sector is the communication among teachers, teachers and students with different experiences and visions, which means a great richness way to build a strong and a sustainable future for, for all. Thank you. A personal device for every student and teacher would mean that its use becomes integrated into their lives and their learning beyond the classroom as they walk to and from school uh, at home. However, introducing M-Learning is likely to be expensive, particularly for national scale projects to be rolled out in schools. 
Indeed, there have been some trials to manufacture devices, particularly for education, but there have often been issues with their quality and sustainability. That having been said, the availability now of smartphones for maybe $35 uh, or, or certainly $50 is beginning to change the game. Greater availability and the falling prices of consumer mobile devices also undermine the economic argument for developing devices specific for education. So we turn now to Mr. Kuma, uh, Director General of Digital Economy in the Posts in Gabon. Uh, monsieur, que pensez-vous sont les meilleures stratégies pour procurer le matériel nécessité pour les écoles? Les tablettes, les appareils mobiles, Wi-Fi et les ordinateurs portables, etc., etc., pour des projets d'éducation à l'échelle nationale. Comment le financement peut être maintenu? Monsieur. Merci. Je suis donc Syriac Didier Kouma, directeur général de la promotion de l'économie numérique. Je parle ici au nom de, du ministre de l'économie numérique et de la Poste du Gabon, son excellence Pasteur Nguanem, qui malheureusement n'a pas pu faire le déplacement de, de Paris ce jour. Euh, effectivement, aborder cette question du finance, de, de, des devices, donc, donc de ces équipements d'accès, c'est de parler de la question de l'accès et de leur financement. Je vais donc tout de suite vous exprimer rapidement rapidement le, le contexte gabonais et, et certainement vous relevez un peu les difficultés que nous avons. Alors, il faut dire que le Gabon, donc, c'est un pays d'à à, à peu près 1,8 million d'habitants, dont 45% de la population est jeune, avec un taux d'alphabétisation qui est autour de 97%. Aujourd'hui, euh, nous avons mis en place, euh, nous déployons actuellement une stratégie numérique euh, sur trois axes, à savoir donc la normalisation, la construction donc des infrastructures de rang mondial et le développement des contenus. C'est dans ce cadre que nous avons aujourd'hui deux points d'atterrissement euh, qui ouvrent le Gabon sur l'international et un maillage des de chefs lieux de, de capital et une dorsale qui est en train donc de s'achever pour relier le pays et les deux, deuxième phases qui se suivent. Ce, cet ensemble aujourd'hui met les technologies donc au centre de ce, du développement et pas les infrastructures pour les infrastructures tout justement. Alors, en matière donc de développement de contenu, c'est le deuxième axe. Nous pensons que pour développer cet axe, il faut avoir une masse critique des spécialistes et des, des, des spécialistes pour créer ces contenus dans le numérique parce que si on a besoin de ces équipements, c'est pour aller chercher de l'information, mais l'information qui soit aussi typique au-delà de l'information globale que nous pouvons donc recueillir à travers le monde. C'est pourquoi nous développons actuellement donc un réseau des incubateurs d'entreprises. Et donc, ce réseau d'incubateurs d'entreprises piloté au niveau donc du ministère de l'économie numérique travaille en étroite collaboration avec donc les, les, les ministères en charge de politiques publiques spécifiques. Parce qu'il faut dire que la question du numérique est donc transversale. Euh, le premier projet sur lequel nous travaillons d'arrache-pied est celui aujourd'hui de l'e-santé. Donc tout ce qui est numérisation des applications en matière de santé et qui a déjà bénéficié donc d'un financement. Nous comptons très vite ouvrir l'autre volet qui va être celui donc de l'e-éducation. Mais en maintenant cela, nous avons donc commencé des expériences de développement avec des classes numériques. Nous avons aujourd'hui déployé plus de sept classes ou monté encore d'autres classes pilotes, mais cette fois-ci avec des tablettes mobiles. Et aujourd'hui, nous continuons donc à, à réfléchir avec le ministère de l'Éducation pour élaborer une, une stratégie. Et là, ce sont des éléments d'attente que nous fondons ici pour trouver rapidement un financement dans ce sens-là. Alors, il faut dire qu'une fois qu'on a déployé ces différents éléments, ce qu'on a observé, c'est déjà un problème fondamental, c'est celui de, du changement. L'accompagnement au changement, parce que des, études, des, des professeurs qu'on a donc pris comme cible pour former, afin donc de, de, de changer deviennent même un frein pour beaucoup d'autres raisons qu'on pourra toujours euh, élaguer et qu'il faut nécessaire donc d'avoir un accompagnement. La question donc de l'accessibilité ne se limite pas qu'à Libreville. Nous avons donc un certain nombre de projets qui est celui de l'accès public, euh, le point d'accès public à Internet qu'on appelle Papi. Papi, ça fait rappeler un peu au grand-père. En Afrique, quand on veut la connaissance, on part chez le grand-père. 
Et aujourd'hui, pour avoir la, la connaissance, on va à l'Internet. Donc, point d'accès public à Internet, c'est un peu le nouveau papy que nous comptons développer et déployer dans les zones rurales pour permettre à ceux-là également d'accéder à la connaissance. Voilà globalement, pour ne pas être plus long, pour montrer l'espérance du Gabon et la nécessité pour nous, un, donc, de financer le changement, de financer le développement des contenus, et surtout l'hébergement, parce qu'un des gros projets qui nous reste dans notre stratégie d'infrastructure, c'est donc un data center. Voilà globalement pour être bref et dire les difficultés et la situation du Gabon. Merci. A roadmap for the introduction of mobile learning is needed to identify a series of steps or phases, together with overall aims, budget, responsibilities and action required. The Singapore government, for example, developed three five-year master plans to guide implementation. The first addressed building the foundation, the second seeding innovation, and the third strengthening and sustaining. Mr. Lufsan Yamts, Director of Innovation, Ministry of Education, Culture and Science in Mongolia. Why do you think that it's important to develop national digital learning strategies? What should these include and what is the best way to develop them in collaboration with the ICT sector? As you mentioned about the roadmap for the policy implementation, so the way uh, in 2012 we uh, adopted the ICT policy framework, uh, was adopted by the government. Within the last uh, three and four years, we have achieved a lot. So because the education is most important sector and important public uh, service delivery in Mongolia, because we have such a long tradition of the, uh, to, to support the kids' learning in, in a family, uh, in, in, in home, in a family. So as you know, the, it's uh, more like in Korean family that really uh, pay attention to their kids' learning. So as well, we do, same, uh, we do pay much. So that's why the, our strategy is uh, we want to bring the old people in Mongolia, all nation, in education. So, And also since 2000, 12, we uh, started the new uh, uh, policy agenda, which is calling uh, supporting every child's learning in Mongolia. So within this uh, policy framework, we elaborated how we, uh, how we support, encourage this uh, policy implementation by use of the mobile technology and uh, by uh, innovation strategy. So, that's why we uh, clearly defined the key uh, targets and objectives uh, within the uh, basic infrastructure development and teachers' ICT development and also the content development. So last four years, we have achieved, achieved some notable uh, success. As I say, uh, first on we established uh, it's the nationwide uh, education sector enterprise architecture. Uh, which uh, uh, it's kind of the software platform which they cover all schools, public schools in Mongolia or in, as well as all provinces. Now in the system we have registered uh, all students. Uh, we have like uh, for uh, primary and secondary we have almost half million students and the plus 28,000 uh, of the teachers, all the personal and by data now in, in our system. And now from this uh, March, we, uh, this system works as a, uh, as a real time basis. Now the all shift this and all this uh, uh, education process, uh, for instance, assessment and the uh, teacher's performance and the school uh, performance, they are now in a real-time basis uh, registration. So uh, that is the, the first uh, uh, step of this uh, policy, uh, policy agenda. So and also that we created the uh, nationwide education sector, uh, sector data, data center and as well as virtual uh, private network. Now in Lambatar city, capital of Mongolia, we established uh, up to 10 gigabyte uh, rings uh, in uh, countryside, like in the provincial level, we uh, established up to one gigabyte uh, uh, network system. So uh, within this, by the end of this year, uh, we will uh, uh, make uh, connectivity for all the schools. Now, 77% of the schools, they are connected in the network and also the, uh, in the integrated uh, national education architecture. So, 
That's why the, uh, the, our challenge is, uh, the key issue is to, to, uh, to encourage the capacity development of the teachers and as well as uh, city literacy of the teachers. So the, for this issue, uh, we, have, uh, we are planning to create the new uh, funds for content development and for the teachers' uh, capacity built. And so. And uh, this year is the, the final year of this uh, first stage of this uh, policy framework. And uh, we, uh, it's the uh, right time to, uh, we discuss this issue in, uh, in Paris with the support of the UNESCO. So because it is uh, July, we expect to have the parliamentary election. That from this year, we will uh, formulate the, a new uh, targets for the next four years. So. Uh, first, the stage was really successfully implemented. So, because now that we are created the nationwide infrastructure and the basic platform for uh, education uh, education sector management. For the next four years, we will consider more about to uh, coherence and to encourage the synergy of the different public sectors uh, into the, our uh, into uh, based on our system. Thank you very much. Developing a vibrant local ICT environment for mobile learning is crucial if we are to have appropriate mobile learning content and services that are culturally adapted while also applying good pedagogical approaches. The system includes mobile learning service providers, app developers, cloud service providers, telecommunication providers, content developers, security experts and many others. This can, though, also be a source for important new business developments for SMEs, one of uh, Hulin Zhao's, uh, the, the Secretary General of the ITU, uh, core initiatives, building SMEs. So, Your Excellency Dr. Anusha Rahman Khan, Minister of State for ICT in Pakistan, how do you think that the local ICT industry can benefit from the large opportunities that mobile learning can offer for business and income generation? How best can we stimulate local entrepreneurs to innovate for the education sector? Honorable Minister. Uh, certainly, ICT ministries are going to play a more meaningful and key role in achieving the sustainable development goals. They lie at the heart of uh, all the work that we do, whether it's agriculture, education, health, learning, and ICT ministries will continue to play that role in uh, the next 15 years, you will see the enhanced participation. The innovation in ICT certainly is redefining the dimensions of uh, socioeconomic development in the world. And I would just like to share with you that the expansion and rollout of mobile infrastructure and services and the introduction of smartphones have played a great role towards bridging the digital divide. Pakistan today is ranked, according to a recent report, as the top most uh, technology user uh, country in the South Asia. Ranking at number four in the e Singh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are also ranked at number four uh, in e Singh, with 70% teledensity, and the mobile broadband now ranked over 15% just in the last one year. Pakistan is playing its role towards adopting innovation and investment in the sector. The government of Pakistan is realizing the significance of these developments in the fields of ICT, and we have accorded the highest priority into the leadership of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif to develop ICT infrastructure, application development for the provisioning of quality E&M services. We, we all understand and completely support the fact that we need to create employment opportunities, increase economic growth, and broadband penetration. And to be able to do that, we require financing. And for the financing side, I would like to share with all of us here who are not in the ICT sector but the education ministries that there is a universal service fund which is being set up by the governments and the contribution comes from the telecom companies. We need to spend that money for the rollout of technology infrastructure in the countries. It's not about the urban cities. It's not about the metropolitans. It's about the underserved and unserved who are to be taken into the fold of technology and to be connected. So how do we do that? First of all, we divest the funds. The sustainable development goals require that all whatever we are trying to do is available for every citizen on the globe. 
and technology is a means to reaching those people. So to take the infrastructure rollout to the underserved, unserved areas, we have to focus at the policy level that we will connect the <coughs> unconnected. We need to connect the next 4.5 billion people in the, by 2020, and we need to all work together to be able to achieve that goal. Now, the facilitation and the mobile learning innovation processes and quality assurance measures, how do we achieve that? Just by rolling out the optic fiber cable and just by providing the technology, we will not be able to achieve the true benefits unless we train the users unless we train people how to use the technology for the benefit for the socioeconomic development of the people, how we can use the technology to uplift the role of the women and girls and the people with disabilities in the society. So for that, we need to come forward and we need to bring out the public-private partnership. Without the public-private partnership, we will not be able to realize the full potential of technology. In Pakistan, we are working with private sector to be able to achieve that goal. The Universal Service Fund in my country is recognized in the, in, the, in the international community as one of the most successful funds, which we roll out with the help of the private sector. And now that using the fund actively, we are also with the help of private sector, for example, I would like to name a few companies who are working with me like Microsoft and Cisco, to train young girls with coding and uh, cloud computing. We have to train the children at a very young age, and particularly the girls, so that they can be economically empowered. If we can achieve that, if we can, because technology alone cannot and will not solve the issue, we need to train the teachers where the open source material is available. We have to train the teachers uh, in innovation. We have to train the teachers to train the students in the right way, in the right dimension. Life is beyond social media usage. Life is beyond games. Life is about building a dynamic knowledge-based economy. So one of the potential business cases for the ICT industry is to use the mobile technology as a vehicle to help bring high-quality learning to people who did not previously have access to it. And I would just like to make one more remark here, that the focus should be to define the characteristics of high-quality mobile learning content and models which will prompt the production and wide dissemination of the content. The local language content is, is one of the key areas of development going forward, particularly in my country. So through mutual collaboration with the stakeholders uh, of, it, of the education and ICT sectors of the country, we can develop mobile technologies which can accelerate the use and sharing of open educational resources and simultaneously better support contents in local languages. Since many educators are sitting here, we would like to, ITUs, uh, the ITU can play a very key role in bringing out the ICT ministries together with UNESCO and other uh, organizations who have to champion their role in their respective areas to develop the internet connectivity, to bring out the student-centric uh, uh, applications, and going forward to take out the big data, cloud solutions, and other uh, technology uh, ventures into the motion. Thank you. Many M-Learning initiatives concentrate on devices and enabling students to access these, but often don't really adequately address the needs of teachers, school leaders, and other staff. Teachers have to be the leaders and be put at the heart to enable them to learn how to integrate mobile technologies into teaching, administration, to ensure the success of any M-Learning initiative. Teachers must have confidence with technology and should never fear that students are more ahead of them. Uh, personally, uh, I don't believe in this generational gap. Older people are able to learn uh, just as well as younger people. They, they need similar amounts of time. So, uh, Your Excellency, how do you think we can bring teachers fully on board? What are the essential elements for continuing professional development programs for teachers on mobile learning? With perhaps some examples from your country. There's going to be about 5 billion new people coming online in the next uh, 10 years. If that's the case, if Kenya is going to remain competitive, we must have everybody moving into digital. So the election campaign was saying that Kenya is going to be a digital country and we're going to have a digital knowledge economy. And to do that, we must then educate uh, everybody. And you know, primarily the education is through the teachers. But to, we also do need to have the right infrastructure in place. And so the uh, project that we have in place, which we call the Digital Learning Program, we've been implementing for the last uh, three years, 
has primarily focused on being able to ensure first there is relevant content that the teachers agree with and understand. So to date, we have trained over 66,000 teachers and primarily to support first the standard one pupils in the primary schools so that they will be able to then grow as we review our curriculum in the next uh, few years. The key challenge is first making sure that the content is universal across the country. The country is, is, is diverse. You've got very rural areas where there is no electricity to places that are fully urban with 4G networks, which, which makes it difficult if you want to make sure that there's even uh, training and uh, support for all the schools. So what we've done is we've got a program where we are rolling out um, infrastructure. This is the electricity to the schools, ensuring that we have broadband in these schools, and this is now being provided by the private sector for free to over 22,000 schools. Um, this is also going to ensure that we're able to provide online learning, but the teachers are at the heart of it. We're ensuring that they are fully trained, and we're doing this on a quarterly basis. We've started a pilot uh, program where we have 150 schools in all 47 counties of the country. We have an urban, peri-urban, and a rural school in place. And each uh, of those schools has two teachers being trained and continuously being informed about the new technologies and new ways of using the different devices. When we started the program, we, we initially thought one device could work for the whole country, but we've seen that we can actually have multiple devices with local manufacturing that's going to allow for both the learning on not just the content, but also the building of the infrastructure and the distribution logistics to make this work. So for teachers, we have ensured that they're, they're the first to learn, that they have uh, access to the content, they contribute to the content as well, and are comfortable with it. And in that way, they are able to support the students and the parents who need to ensure that we have continued use of the technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a rich diet of information and ideas. We have timely ministers. This is, this is almost unheard of. But uh, we know that uh, developing education strategy is not difficult. So we know there is infrastructure elements, curriculum, pedagogy, introducing to technology. This is not rocket science in 2016. My question to you is somewhere else. How do you create political will in your countries? And I know how much uh, UNESCO is suffering in countries in the world to make a politician, a policymaker, sitting behind a desk, sign on a strategy or a policy to improve education systems. How do you overcome partisan politics? Every minister wanna come and redesign a new strategy, though the previous one is good, but we wanna redo it because we wanna prove success ourselves. How do you get the buy-in of your public servants and many times they're so behind in technology? The, thank the issue most of the time is political. How do you overcome this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to take the political will answer actually first. I mean, if there was no political will, none of us would be sitting here. So I think when there is political will, you will find ministers proactively participating in these discussions and taking it on as our duty that now that we have all signed up the sustainable development goals, we are all committed to the sustainable development goals. Why we are also committed is because we don't want them to fail again like the MDGs. And we are all trying to facilitate the process of achieving the goals that we have set for ourselves. Nobody has forced those goals upon us. Those have been, this is an activity which we have ourselves taken it upon ourselves. Now, the political will definitely is accruing. The times are changing very fast. In my country, the youth population is 60%. We are about 200 million people in Pakistan. And 60% comprises of people who are under the age of 30. And education is lying at the heart of our pol policy frameworks. The Telecom Policy 2015, the document that Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has given out just in December 2015, is focusing on infrastructure, providing EM services, putting education at the heart of my telecom policy. Is a, is a document that we are pursuing and we are allocating funding for that as well. So the infrastructure deployment, I mean, I would like to share with you that we have just in the last uh, one year, we have allocated projects of 20 billion rupees in the underserved, unserved areas to provide 3G services, the rural telephony services, optic fiber cable to, the, to provide services to the underserved, to underserved, to get them connected. So these policies are now something that we have all made together, committed as a global community to the documents that we have signed in, putting them in our 
domestic policy frameworks, which are now we, uh, rolling out. So when you come to that stage, it is very difficult to undo the work that has already been done, because then there is a political backlash to it. Thank so you. that's my answer Thank for you. Pakistan. I'd, I'd, yeah. the, the, the regulator is absolutely championing uh, the cause of people with disabilities that's as well. Right. Uh, but are there any ministers of education here who would like to tackle uh, the, the, the question about changing pedagogies? When we are focusing on infrastructure and when we are ranked as the top South Asian country using technology and uptake of telecommunication, perhaps other countries would have reached that goal earlier. So when we are learning from each other, I believe that the open educational resources are all there to be taken care, to, to, to be adopted. And if we are going to reinvent the wheel and we are looking for perfection, we will not be able to achieve it. So we need to go step by step and see what the technologies have given to other developed countries, all those who have tested and tried it, and learning from their improve and amend according to our local circumstances. We cannot have one size fit all strategy. So I think that we, we can work in cooperation and collaboration and work together with yourselves to find out what has worked and what has not worked. Rather than testing and failing, I would like to test, try and succeed. Thank you very much. I'm sure that some of these initiatives to uh, enable teachers to have free access to the internet are sustainable, uh, if anyone would like to take that. And the second, I, I, I think, is, is crucial and uh, uh, we, we, we really should, must address it, is the issue around security. Uh, and I know that Minister Anu but I, I think if other people want to take that, but if they don't, I, I'd like, because uh, I know you champion that cause. So uh, would anyone like to uh, respond with some good ideas around how you make things sustainable? And we'll then come to Kenya at the end. Yes, madam. Oh. Telephone companies, and they are quite involved in uh, giving us uh, free internet for different schools, especially secondary schools, uh, because we, as the education sector, we alone, we cannot afford to spread internet. And fortunately, many of the companies we have in place are giving us the opportunities of having free internet for different schools, secondary schools mm -hmm. and universities. Uh, that, that, and I think that that's fantastic. So multi-stakeholder yeah. partnerships yeah. are certainly one option. I wanted to just intervene on the question of free access to the internet for enseignants. I want to take the example of Burkina Faso. We have a network we call the Resina, the Informatic National Network of Administration. So it's a network where we loue the the band passing on the level of an operator called Onatel to interconnect the different buildings of administration, including the Ministry of Education. So there's also the project Backbone that will come to boost a little bit this problem so that the enseignants can have the free access to the internet. Merci. Merci, Madame. Uh, Anusha, would you like very, say very briefly on something that, that you're doing on cyberbullying, harassment, all of these issues? It's very important. Yeah, first of all, I would just like to uh, uh, apprise this uh, honourable forum that the security issue is being handled by the VISIS. And uh, just recently, it has come on the agenda of the UN, and we discussed it under VISIS 10 at the United Nations. And cybersecurity and cybercrimes are being handled at that platform. So ITU alone is not looking at security. It's a much broader subject. In Pakistan, we are uh, now championing the, the cybersecurity legislation. Cyber crimes bill uh, is being discussed, where we are putting in special uh, provisions where we are providing uh, uh, internet which is safe for women, for girls particularly, and providing a safe internet zone for everybody, for all the users. We know, after looking at the stats, that m the females are leaving the internet space because of cyber bullying, cyber issues, phishing, and other cyber security issues. And we want the women and the girls to come back on the internet, and we need to create special legislation for that so that they feel secure online. So our basic, uh, I would like to say, fundamental behind the cybersecurity law, that cyber crimes law that we are uh, formulating here, being discussed at the National Assembly, is that the users should have the same rights online as they have offline. So you cover the freedom of expression and you also handle the cyber challenges that you just mentioned. Could you just in one minute each to conclude this session uh, try and say what your biggest challenge is or turn it around the other way? What's your greatest dream? 
biggest challenge has been, I would say, vendors. So ensuring that you're getting the right devices for a project of this size, there's a lot of uh, money that is being spent and therefore a lot of interest from everybody and um, ensuring that it is done openly and correctly. That's been, I would say, our number one challenge, but we've overcome that so far. Thank you very much. The literacy rate so that everybody can read and uh, can read and have access to M-learning. I think the big challenge is to uh, teachers, uh, ICT, uh, literacy and the development. So, but uh, we uh, would uh, to share the different uh, international experiences and bring into the Mongolian context. So, but the problem is also not about the teachers and as well as the key issue is the uh, students. They must, you know, if they willing to use the ICT, the government we will provide the involvement to use uh, that. Uh, maybe the, uh, I don't know that, that much about the pedagogical risk taking. So, because it's better to the uh, teachers, they can cooperate with the students in the classroom level. Maybe the, uh, the teachers only they can in a seat of the driver of pedagogy and also the teachers, they can learn from the students also. They can cooperate, they can they use uh, together or ICT devices in a classroom. Yeah. Regarding the uh, uh, cable security, we have the legislation as well as the, we, uh, we considered that when we started this uh, project, uh, uh, education platform, now that we are working on the digital uh, signature, uh, uh, digital signature uh, project. So the, within the two years, up to, we plan it to all citizens in Mongolia, they would have uh, digital the own uh, personal signature so then uh, we can the, the, uh, solve this issue and as well as also to, we in a parallel in our system in a parallel we are backing up our old data all uh, uh, progresses we at the same time we are backing in a national separate national data center so thank you very much Any challenges frankly because if we all work together when there's a will there's a way and if you work together we can achieve all our goals and my uh, ambition, uh, frankly, is very clear. I need accelerated digitized, digitized ecosystem with special emphasis on uh, uh, bridging the broadband divide to enable socioeconomic growth and to expanding the knowledge-based economy, spur economic growth, provide and bring the girls at, uh, in the mainstream, empower them, and to work for the people with disabilities. We can Thank all you. achieve it together. Merci. Je vais simplement rappeler une chose, c'est que au niveau du Gabon, le développement humain est au centre de, de toutes les politiques publiques. Euh, L'État a mis le développement des technologies de l'information au centre donc de, du développement de toutes ces politiques. Le grand défi, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, c'est réellement repenser en profondeur la formation, mais pas que la, les, par les enseignants. Même les journalistes qui sont aussi des, des, des éducateurs de masse, c'est un problème de fond, puisque là, ça rejoint un peu la question de la masse d'informations qu'on on, on y a accédé. Donc, il faut qu'on ait des bons coachs. Et l'un des grands défis que nous euh, formulons, et le rêve du Gabon, c'est tout justement d'amener la technologie à tout le monde, quel que soit l'endroit, même de, je vais parler donc des zones rurales, pour que l'égalité des chances soit accordée à tous. Merci à Madame la ministre. Mon pays va continuer à, à développer le, le, le projet Large Ban et l'intégration des, des TIC au niveau de, de l'éducation. Merci. Merci. Thank the honorable ministers for making this session.